Hello, hello everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Tammy again for this such interesting and insightful lecture in the latest cancer development. I think it's uh, always a bit of fresh air, uh, presentations like that. Me, on the other hand, uh, I'm like a Barcelona heat coming to you with more computational stuff. And uh, speaking of which, I'm going to talk about uh, protein modifications and how MaxQuant can identify those. So in general, uh, the signal of modifications uh, is reflected in mass shifts. Those mass shifts you can observe in MS1 spectrum or MS2 spectrum. Moreover, uh, depending on which amino acid, depending on which amino acid was modified, different parts of iron series will be shifted in MS2 spectrum, thus allowing us to uh, localize uh, the modification. Using, using this information, MaxQuant can search for uh, modifications in conventional Andromeda search. Here, uh, you specify each modification you're interested in, uh, which in turn adds this modification into a uh, um, target decoy database during uh, an Andromeda search. You can add uh, as pre, uh, you can add modification that have been pre-selected in MaxQuant, or you configure your own modification. You can configure your own modification, which I will hopefully show you later how to do that. Um, However, this uh, approach with modifications during conventional Andromeda search poses uh, two major problems. First of all, any PTM that hasn't been specified in this section will not be looked for, and Max1 will not find it. On the other hand, every uh, modification that you add here increases computational effort exponentially. So what you can do here is uh, to look for a small set of already known modifications. What if you want to look for various modifications or all of them, or even look for unknown modifications? That's where dependent peptides search comes in. Uh, the idea of dependent peptides is that we are looking for modified versions of peptides that were already identified in a conventional Andromeda search. This implies two things, that um, dependent peptide search is a separate step after conventional search, and that uh, only those modified peptides can be found uh, which have uh, their unmodified version in uh, conventional search. What uh, modifications can dependent peptide search find? Firstly, and mostly, it's uh, known or unknown or unexpected post-translational modifications. And by unexpected, I mean that in a certain experimental settings, we don't expect this uh, PTM to be present and we can not account for it, for example, in conventional search. Uh, secondly, it's uh, protease cleavage sites that we haven't account for. It can be, uh, for example, some protease aside from trypsin. And lastly, it's uh, uh, substitutions in amino acid chain that come from uh, genetic s and -Ps. So um, to dive into the dependent peptide search algorithm, we first should look into the conventional Andromeda search algorithm. Here, uh, we construct theoretical MSMS spectra database from the FASTA file uh, we've been supplied. From here, we construct a decoy MSMS spectra database, and then we uh, score and identify uh, observed MSMS spectral database against theoretical and decoy MSMS spectral database. I will uh, naming those target decoy database uh, in the future. The trick that we can use here 
is that uh, observed MSMS spectrum should approximately have uh, the same uh, MZ as uh, its theoretical match. So we don't have to look through the whole database, we just have to look through uh, a portion of it that corresponds to uh, observed MSMS spectrum. Uh, thereby, we uh, introduce this restriction for uh, the search. On the next step in the peptide vendor search, the um, MSMS spectra that wasn't identified in the first conventional search takes place of observed MSMS spectra. And MSMS spectra identified in the first conventional search takes place of uh, the target database. Also from this identify MSMS spectra, we then construct decoy MSMS spectra. Now, uh, when we comparing uh, spectrum from, uh, from identified unidentified space to uh, the spectrum in identified space, uh, we know uh, delta mass between them. And from, del from that delta mass, uh, we try to infer which uh, modification, with which modification we are working. Uh, but uh, it's not a trivial task to calculate an Andromeda score for uh, spectra with delta mass. And that's where uh, localization step comes in. For identified uh, spectra, we know uh, their corresponding sequences. We take those sequences and we artificially place a modification with delta mass uh, on each of the amino acids in that sequence, in those sequences. Uh, like so, uh, we get uh, ion series, uh, different parts of which, uh, uh, with different parts of those shifted. For example, uh, we, if we um, place delta mass on the last amino acid of the sequence, then uh, the whole Y ion series uh, will be shifted towards a uh, higher mass region. We then uh, map this to uh, an ob observed spectra and get uh, an Andromeda score for the last amino acid. We then move on to the second to last uh, amino acid, place uh, a PTM on this amino acid, and then we get a spectrum where all of the Y ions uh, are shifted except the first one. And then we map this spectrum to the observed one and get Andromeda score for this amino acid. We do so for all of the amino acids that uh, we have in the sequence, and we select uh, the best Andromeda score out of those. And like so, we get an Andromeda score for a single comparison of identified and identified spectrum. But since we uh, don't know uh, the modification we're working with, we are working with, we have to do so uh, across all the identified and decoy MSMS spectra database for each of the um, MSMS spectra in unidentified space. That's why the dependent peptide search uh, is more. Uh, is quite com computationally expensive. Now, on this slide, you can see somewhat standard results from uh, dependent peptide search, and note that on y axis, that y axis is in log scale. So uh, the results are actually dominated by modifications in the interval of minus plus uh, 100 daltons. And those modifications include uh, ethylation, acetylation, deamine and what's interesting is that we have uh, an unmodified peak. And this is due the fact that uh, dependent peptide search uh, incorporates intensity information inside of its uh, target decoy database. And this uh, increases the specificity of uh, this second search, allowing us to retrieve more uh, from the initial uh, observed space. Uh, you can also see uh, 
minus 1500 to minus 500 uh, mass tail, which corresponds to the cleave peptides table. This, and uh, this is represented as lar minus large delta mass. And also have a, a, a reverse picture where we get uh, extended peptides. This is a short explanation how you uh, turn on uh, dependent peptide search. In your uh, an analysis, you go to uh, global parameters, identification, scroll down, and here you uh, press dependent peptide search with the custom FDR and uh, default mass bin set. I recommend you place it as it is, unless if you know what you're doing. Um, at the end, the information on dependent peptide search is stored in uh, both old peptides table and MSMS table. It's just this information uh, is connected either to peptide sequences or MSMS scans. And here you can uh, see all the different fields of dependent peptide search and its uh, results uh, in both of those tables. So that was the first part of the uh, presentation, and I'd like to hear some questions from you. Uh, thank you. It's very interesting. I've never used it. Is it similar to uh, like mass tolerance search? Does it give you delta M's at the end? Or does it give you like mm -hmm. the, so, the mm -hmm. data, like the modifications that are existing in configuration of max quant already? Andromeda? So um, max quant has um, modifications that it accounts for during dependent peptide search. So it has a list of those. If it doesn't find a modification in that list, it outputs a delta mass that you yourself can check for some modification that you're interested in. So, yes. Great, thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, thanks, you just showed us an unmodified peak and you said that the dependent peptide search integrates in uh, intensities in its theoretical spectra and that's how it's possible to find these. Uh, could you explain this a bit more in depth? How can it integrate intensity? This is, uh, first of all, thank you for the question. That's a very interesting topic that's often overlooked and it's actually uh, directly connected to the DIA search. Uh, so when a standard Andromeda search is performed, and we construct our target decoy database from the FASTA file, we construct it without any intensity information. So the peaks in the target decoy database have the same intensity. They just differ by MZ. And uh, we then uh, map it uh, against the MSMS spectra in observed space. And uh, well, obviously, if we don't have intensity information in target decoy space, we can't uh, uh, we uh, uh, get well artificially worse uh, Andromeda score than than uh, we would get if we would have this intensity information? But when we move to dependent search, we get we take uh, MSMS matches from uh, our sample that have intensity information. And we then map our un unidentified, still unidentified search space against those spectra with intensity information. And that allows us to more precisely map those unidentified spectra to, uh, well, to presumably unidentified versions of uh, the peptides, but in reality, we uh, so, but in case of unmodified, we just retrieve more uh, base peptides. And this is, so Jürgen will talk more about it later, but this is how library mode in DIA is performed. So you first run DDA analysis, get this uh, spectrum library from DDA analysis, and you supply this library into the DIA analysis. And you always uh, see that it's either library mode or discovery mode, but both of those modes generate libraries with intensity information. And this is crucial for DA analysis. 
because that's how we get more uh, specificity there. So, uh, any other questions? Hi. Uh, just a simple con confirmation. Uh, from what I understand, uh, only those identified peptides can, uh, we, uh, if they have modifications, can be identified, right? Yes, we can find uh, modifications of uh, of previously identified mass mass spectra. So if it's not identified by previous searches, and they cannot identify it at all. Um, so again, it's to the previous question. In um, it can be identified. It just won't be. Um, M it won't bear a modification. It will be marked as uh, unmodified peptide. That's just exactly. So, uh, but if you're looking for modifications, that's uh, only the case for the peptides that were identified in the previous step. I, um, when looking actively for cleave, uh, cleave peptides, is there a gain in using dependent peptides as opposed to semi-triptych search? Mm, that's uh, also a good question. So um, there is a gain, though uh, it might be not as big as you would expect. It. If it just if you're looking uh, for occurrences other than triptych, semi-triptych, then you need uh, dependent. So you're specifically looking for uh, cleavages of, of other, uh, like you have. Uh, you're interested in cleavages of 10 different proteases. Then you turn on the peptide peptides. You, obviously, if you're looking at the mostly trip, trips inside that, you, you should uh, vary this parameter. Thank you. There was a question about the mass shift localization. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that the um, each individual amino acid is tested for whether or not the resulting spectra will fit the observed spectra. Is that computationally less expensive than perhaps looking at what the mass shift is and potentially being informed as to which amino acid that modification is likely to sit? For instance, a mass shift associated with oxidation mm -hmm. is quite so, likely to sit on the methylene, for instance. Okay, if I understand correctly, you ask if this is less computationally expensive than checking for modification during conventional uh, Andromeda search, where we specified like each modification. Yes, it's with, um, rather than checking every single amino acid in the entire peptide, being mm -hmm. informed, uh, almost prioritizing which amino acids to check for first, by so, um, magnitude of the mass. You see, um, different modifications have different specificity toward different amino acids. So yes. yeah, that's in, in case for the phosphorylation, we would look primarily on STY. But here in dependent peptide search, we don't uh, know prior to the search which modification we are working with. And that's why we're checking. So uh, it can be phosphorylation, distillation, any modification, even uh, cleavage. So that's uh, why dependent peptide search uh, uh, incorporates this checking of every uh, amino acid. It's like it's not the computational question; it's a computational. It's a question of what we're looking for. So if you're looking specific for a specific modification that, and you know which amino acids that uh, usually modified, then you should probably specify it during conventional search. Okay, so this stage identifies not only the modification but also the localization. Yes, it, yes. So two in one step. Okay, so, thank you. Good to understand. And uh, I hope if the the its moment this moment is uh, understandable that um, the initial spectra is taken from identified uh, search space. And then uh, different parts of the spectra are shifted depending on which amino acid is modified. So it can be, so uh, all of those uh, ions here are uh, having uh, normal states and shifted states throughout this algorithm. Now I'll briefly show you how you uh, configure 
um, your own modifications during conventional um, X1 search. And uh, I'll start with, um, uh, well, well, presenting two uh, different modifications. First is our phosphorylation of tyrosine, which results in a heavier molecule and um, uh, thus uh, plus delta uh, mass. And second is uh, a transformation of tyrosine into the hydroalanine, which results in lighter molecule and uh, minus delta mass. To configure our own modifications, so um, don't be scared right now. This is probably the first time uh, in, in this uh, workshop. So um, this is Max One in all of its beauty. And uh, just don't rush to open it. I'll just uh, show you some few uh, key steps at configuring your own modifications if you're looking at it in a conventional search. So first of all, um, there is a list of uh, predefined modifications, and you, if you're looking for like specific modification, you can press uh, find function. Uh, also, you go into the configuration tab at first. So you press the find function, and let's say if you want to look for you press find next. And here you have it. You have a phosphorylation modification, and it has. Uh, different parameters much some of them more relevant some of them less so we have a name description then uh, the chemical composition which you can copy paste from somewhere or you can uh, set it manually by yeah here it is by uh, pressing change button and uh, adding or decreasing the atom count so here you select atom and then you uh, select the number of those so uh, you further um, can change, select if uh, the position of this modification where it can be located can be located. If this is a post-translational modification or it's a label, isobaric label, substitution, we can and so on. So here apply standard. If it creates a, a new terminus, and then we have a. a specific properties for each of amino acids this uh, modification can be performed on so for example in case of phosphorylation for s and t we can see neutral losses in the spectrum and from y uh, we can see uh, diagnostic peaks in our uh, spectrum so uh, what if you want to set your modification so Generally, you can find its uh, information on the present modification on the unimod.org. Let's say we want to add uh, the hydra alanine transformation, as I already showed you. Uh, yeah, we type here. Uh, we're looking at the hydra alanine from tyrosine, and here. Here we have it. Uh, you can again copy information from Unimod or specify your modification yourself by hand, if it, for example, not in Unimod. So uh, to do so, you press Add. You type new name, and you you can, for example, paste its uh, composition or you can again press change and uh, select manually which atoms you want to choose also you have even the element table here uh, here you have uh, the delta mass changed uh, so here for this modification we remain we place the same these parameters and uh, we also need to make uh, amino acid specification. In this case, we are looking for tyrosine. Yeah, and we also should deselect a uh, default amino acid lysine. So we've uh, just set up a new modification that we, we can uh, use in the future. So to save her, uh, to save it, you should press modify table, 
and save changes. And here you have like new modification in the table. Uh, to see it in your uh, modification parameters, like when you actually set up your run, you need to, you'll need to reboot minus one, which I won't do now, but just note. So uh, you can also uh, add uh, a new protease into analysis. For that, you will press proteases. And uh, for example, here we have a uh, trypsin, uh, all known and loved. So trypsin cleaves after arginine and lysine, but not before proline. And here, um, the specificity is defined uh, where rows specify after which amino acid the protease cleaves, and in column we define uh, before which amino acid protease cleaves. So we can set, uh, yeah, I'll now um, show how you set your own uh, protease. So you press add. You um, just um, place B, for example, and uh, let's say I want it to cleave um, after after serine, and I press S plus here on row and selects all the serine. But to make an exception, I can uh, press on any of the combinations here and it won't uh, select those to in search. So again, to save that, you press modify table, save changes. And uh, if you want to have it in the group specific parameters, you again, reboot next quant. So I, that's uh, all for my half practice tutorial. Uh, and uh, is, do I have time to explain neutral losses? And okay. so. As I already said, uh, in the case of phosphorylation, we see S in ST neutral losses and in Y diagnostic peaks. Now, what are neutral losses and diagnostic peaks? Uh, during uh, peptide fragmentation, not only bonds inside of the peptide are broken, it may occur that the side chains can be also broken. And that results usually in water losses, amino, uh, ammonia losses, or it can be uh, a loss of modifications, such as phosphorylation. And uh, since uh, S, uh, serine and threonine uh, doesn't form such a strong bond, it's more likely uh, for these neutral losses from those amino acids to occur. And when we see uh, this neutral loss peak and an original peak inside of uh, MSMS spectrum, uh, then we can use this information to further localize uh, our phosphorylation and we gain information of it. However, it's not the case uh, with the tyrosine. Uh, um, a phosphor group creates much stronger uh, bond with the tyrosine that can uh, be even, that can even overcome uh, the peptide bond by its strength. And this may lead to um, peptide breaking on the both sides of the tyrosine. Uh, this creates uh, a peak of a single tyrosine with modification, and th that's what's called uh, diagnostic peaks. Uh, and if we see those, we uh, gain even more information on the localization of uh, modification. So again, you can add those neutral losses diagnostic peaks, and usually they are, uh, they exclude each other. 